Welcome to my hotel room late at night. I'm sat here reading um, papers about inclusive research and reflecting on what I'm doing in my work. So in the first paper that was published as a part of my PhD with my supervisors and um, my colleagues, we wrote that when embarking on new research with people with profound disabilities, researchers shouldn't start by attempting to modify currently accepted models of inclusive research. Instead, we should begin from a deep understanding of people with profound and multiple learning disabilities or profound intellectual and multiple disabilities, depending on where you are and what terms you use. And so a lot of inclusive research practice has, has been fantastic and has been about enabling people with moderate intellectual disabilities to understand the processes that researchers use and the things that researchers do in order that they can do those things too. So time has been spent training people with intellectual disabilities to become researchers and support has been put in place to help them to like manage things like um, getting to places on time and stuff like that so that they can be involved in the meatiness of doing research. But the idea that, oh sorry about the bleeps, the idea that those adaptations as valuable and as like wonderful as they are make research inclusive is a stumbling block when it comes to people with profound intellectual and multiple disabilities because no matter how much you adapt in things or like no matter how easy read your um, research material was or how simplified your writing was it's never going to be accessible to somebody with that profound a cognitive impairment and so in my doctoral work what I'm hoping to do is to do research with people with profound intellectual and multiple disabilities and I don't mean that they'll just be sort of an active part in the work that I do I want us to do a piece of research together and I recognise that chances are, um, certainly by the time I've finished all this reading, like we'll only be able to do a very small piece of research together. Most of the challenge that I'm facing in my PhD is, is not um, doing that little piece of research, it's figuring out how I'm going to do that little piece of research and that challenge that <laughs> I think I wrote like this paper was co-authored but I think I remember like writing the second half of that sentence and saying we should start from where they are and then figure out how to come out from that and if you think about what research is in a kind of you know, like a like like a sort of grand scale philosophy like what what does it mean it in my head it's fundamentally about finding new understanding or uncovering new knowledge or experiencing new meaning it's that when we were inducted as postgraduate researchers, they gave us an inspirational presentation and, and part of that was they said, you've got to imagine all the knowledge that there is in the world and they drew a big circle. This is all the knowledge and your job as a researcher is just to, and they did like a little pimple on this big circle of knowledge. You've just got to push forth the boundaries of knowledge just a little bit and that, pushing forth the boundaries of knowledge or that extension to understanding or that apprehension of a new bit of meaning. If that's what research is, 
at its core. Yes, it's all the other things, all the methodologies and all the you know systems that we have for doing it. That's those are the hows of how we do that pushing forth of the boundaries. But if that's what it is, and I've got to do that with somebody with profound intellectual disabilities, then my challenge is to find a research space that we can occupy together. And I'm currently um, doing work in the field with some people with profound intellectual and multiple disabilities. And I was going to talk to you about um, one of them. She's called Senan. Um, and if I can, if I have the video skills, I'll put a picture of Senan here. So that you can see, so that you can meet her visually. Um, Senan's a young lady with a complex intellectual disability, multiple physical and sensory impairments, and co occurring health conditions, and all the things that you would typically expect of somebody who carries that label of profound intellectual and multiple disabilities. And when I'm with Senan, I won't go. I won't go on too much of a tangent, but my reflective practice is being informed by Merleau-Ponty's phenomenology of perception. And in that, he's trying to describe our experience of being conscious, as many phenomenologists do. And he's recognizing that our experience of being conscious is not always the same as um, a scientific description of the world, a, not a, sci a natural sciences description of the world. You know, uh, the natural sciences might say um, that when I reach for my can of Diet Coke, <laughs> I, you know, signals go from my brain, they send messages to my muscles, that causes my muscles to contract, my hand extends. That's That's what happens, but that's not my experience of it. My experience of it is me thinking, hmm, <laughs> Coke. Uh, so I and he says we place our intention in the in the coke or in the whatever it is, and then we experience our consciousness as a movement towards the world. So you look at the coke and you think coke, and then you move towards it, and, and that's your experience of being conscious. And this idea of where your intention is, if you sort of think of if my intention is in the coke. My connect, my intention is connected up to my experience of consciousness. And my experience of consciousness is my being, you know. And so when I'm working with somebody who can appear very passive and can appear to not be doing much or, you know, not be capable of much, to what I'm thinking is, where is their intention? like and so I've been spending time with Zenon and thinking where is your intention and it's really interesting because I used to be a teacher of children with complex needs and when I was a teacher I always had something that I was trying to bring I was always trying to like his literacy his numeracy his you know whatever the thing was I had something I was trying to bring here it is and I was trying to find ways of like breaking it down and making it bite size but I was always approaching with here's this thing and here's the person and I'm I'm going here's this thing here's this thing and I'm changing this thing and but I was always on this side going this is coming at you and in my work now as a researcher my aim isn't to bring anything to Senan or to the people that I'm working with, it's to try and get me here where they are. And so I've been with Senan and she, um, it, when I see her, she's often lying down in an achiever bed and her hands are typically up like in fists near her face and her eyes move around, but I, I don't get the feeling that she's connecting visually with me and she quite often has her tongue out and and she's licking her finger or she hooks this finger into the corner of her mouth and then she's sort of like 
part lapping on it, part sucking on it. Sometimes she moves to her arm and things. And I was watching her and thinking, where is your intention? And you look and you think, it's here. Like it's, it was in this area around her, like it was in a really, if I'd drawn it, if you took a photo of her and I'd drawn it on her, I'd just draw it like around her, around here. And so I was trying initially to start an intensive interaction conversation with her and to, you know, uh, attune my effect to her effect so that we could create that sort of responsive connection and communication and I was matching her sounds and matching her gestures and her movements and I was getting really quite close to her like she's got her head on a pillow and my head is probably only a head's distance away from her and I was going to say I was doing all those things right. There's, there's not a, there's not like a right way of doing those things. But I was giving it my all. You know, I was doing a really good impression. And you could, you actually probably could have recorded that, and it would have looked like an intensive interaction conversation because I was responding to her, and then after a while she makes a noise, and and then I make a noise back, and it looks like a to and fro, but it didn't feel like a to and fro. It didn't feel like a connection. Maybe she was responding, maybe she was chatting and I I wasn't picking it up. But I didn't feel like I'd met her yet. And so I was thinking, where is your intention? And it's just here. And I thought, I, I have to get into that space. And so I brought my hand up really close to her so that it was touching against the finger that she was licking so that sometimes my finger got licked. And then one time when she put her tongue out, I pinged her tongue with the end of my finger to go like I see I see what you're doing I'm there I'm noticing this and by trying to bring my being right into that little space and I was really careful because when I did the flicking her tongue thing I don't want it to end up being a game where I'm like pinging your tongue every time you stick it out because as fun as that would be I want I want to be in that space with her so that once we have been got used to being in that space together we like know the lay of the land in there and then we could have a look around and maybe find something out or maybe I could introduce a, a research question that's what I hope to do later in my work introduce a question into that space but when you're doing that work of trying to bring because it's not just about the physical aspect. I've got to bring my intention into that space. I've got to bring my being into that space. I've got to, you know, there's a whole busy room going on around me. It was gone all dark. <laughs> and and I've got to be sort of aware of that stuff, but not distracted out by it. I just want to be... <laughs> I just want to be in that little space and once you're there and I can't really say I've done it very much like I I figure I've managed it maybe once or twice so far and I've been I've been working um with Sen and with my other collaborators for quite a while now once you're in there and and you're in this little world of like intention and being questions that I used to ask like or oh, which which object did they prefer or what did they choose or um they're just so far away it like and I want to get into that space and then work out from there rather than going you know a bit like I used to when I was a teacher here's what I need to teach you and I'm bringing it to you and I'm going to adjust it and I'm going to change it and it's it's going to come to you somehow I don't want to go this is what research is this is how research is done and we're going to figure out a way for you to do this I want to start from here and in here recognize that you are experiencing something that is meaningful something that counts and I, I want to have that experience too. I want to join you in that place. And then maybe I'll I'll pop out of that space and try and articulate it in a different space. But the doing of the research 
it won't require me to provide any training to enable this person to do something else or to modify an approach to so it matches to it's gonna <laughs> I don't know that it will. I don't even know. I sit here and think, oh, maybe I've just imagined it all. <laughs> but I would love to to be able to occupy that space. And it feels tangible sometimes. And work out from there. And I think that's, I don't know how well that's articulated, but it's late at night on a Friday. And yeah. <laughs> Does it does it make sense to anybody?